Good morning, it is 11.30 a.m. and that means it is time for another episode of First Chapter Fun. This is episode, oh gosh, 40, 45 I think. So we've been doing this for 45 days in a row and I'm delighted that it's still going and that it will continue but I'll announce something next week. So this is the place, in case you have not joined First Chapter Fun before, this is the place where from March 17th until May 8th, every day on Instagram Live, down on my iPad and on Facebook Live over my iPhone, I am reading the first chapter of a different book, not mine, but other authors, with their consent, of course, and the permission of the publisher at 11.30 Eastern Time. And lots of regular regulars tuning in. Um, we already have, let me see, we have Genevieve Graham, and I'm reading from her book. Good morning, Genevieve. I'm so glad you found us. We have Jennifer Jumba, who regularly um, joins in. We have Pugs and Pages. <laughs> we have Hank Philippi Ryan, who always joins. We have Michelle. We have Amanda. We have lots, and another Michelle. We have lots Lots of people. We have Judy Rose who joins almost every day on Facebook and Janice as well and Nancy. Wow, Carla, we have Glennie too, we have and Ali, my goodness, we have lots of people. This is amazing. And Genevieve just said, I'm so excited, so am I. I'm so nervous. So I, I sound a bit um a bit throaty because I just did a one hour um animation voiceover session. So I have I have done some voice work, but it's been commercial stuff like um, flash liquid gel, small but more powerful, that kind of stuff. So I actually took a class uh, two weeks ago for commercial and I was entered into a competition and I won uh, a workout or a workshop for animation. So I spent the last hour pretending to be Taylor the, Barbar the Barbaricorn who was half unicorn and half barbarian. Think He-Man uh, as a horse with a horn. So I was doing stuff like, allow me to fill your ears. So yeah, so my voice is a bit, <coughs> a bit strained. Anyway, it was a ton of fun. That was with uh, Kim Hurden casting, KH casting, casting in Toronto. If anyone is interested in doing voice work, they are doing um, weekly sessions all the time. Um, every Friday I think they release the upcoming sessions and they're 25 bucks for an hour so they're, they're really good fun all by Zoom. Anyway so <laughs> that's why I sound a bit throaty um, and Kaylee just said and your noir reading too last night. Yes last night I joined noir at the bar uh, in Boston and um, I read from Sister Dear the first chapter. That's on my Facebook page actually. I, sa I saved a link I was the last author to read, but you should watch the whole thing. It was really a lot of fun. There were six of us, I think, who read. Um, anyway, let me introduce you. I don't need my glasses just yet. Enough about me. Let me introduce you to today's author. This is a gorgeous book called The Forgotten Home. I have a paperclip. The Forgotten Home Child by Gene Genevieve Graham. There we go. That is the gorgeous cover. Isn't that... It's historical fiction, as you can probably tell. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. And she just sent me a message earlier. She said, I thought I'd pop in and let you know that I found out yesterday that the book is still number one in Canadian fiction on the Toronto Star Globe and Mail bestsellers list. That's seven weeks, seven weeks at number one, Genevieve. That is amazing. Congratulations. That's just absolutely outstanding. And she says she wrote the book to give the British home children the recognition and respect they have deserved for so long. And now that so many people are reading their story, they're finally getting it. Isn't that lovely? That's amazing. Seven weeks. Congratulations. That is just absolutely stellar. I'm going to show you the cover again. Hold on. Oh, it's gone dark. There we go. There we go. The Forgotten Home Child by Genevieve Graham. So let me read you a fellow Canadian author. I know I don't sound Canadian, but I have the passport. So what do you want from me? <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So let me read you um, Genevieve's bio. So Genevieve Graham is the best-selling author of Tides of Honour, Promises to Keep, Come From Away, at the Mountain's Edge and her most recent hit or smash hit, I should say, The Forgotten Home Child, which has been number one on the Toronto Star's bestseller list since it released on March 3rd. So that's seven weeks. Yay! 
Uh, Genevieve was born in Toronto and graduated from the University of Toronto with a Bachelor of Music in Performance, playing the oboe. I love the oboe, it's very soothing. On a ski vacation in Banff, she met her husband to be in a chair line in a in a chairlift lineup, as you do, and they lived in Calgary for 18 years, bringing two amazing daughters into the world. They moved to Nova Scotia in 2008, where she discovered how little she knew about Canada's history. Genevieve never considered being a writer until she was in her 40s. Snap. Same for me. <laughs> but her research evolved into writing historical fiction, her favourite genre. She is passionate about breathing life into Canadian history, reaching readers' hearts and their minds. And she plans for a new release every year. And you can visit her at GenevieveGraham.com. So, I love that, meeting at a, at a chairlift. Isn't that great? What a great story. That's a, we need to know more about that story, Genevieve. We need to, we need, who made the first move? Who made the first comment? Did, did he go over your skis as they do sometimes? What happened? You know, tell us more. Tell us the story. And as always, I will, um, I forgot to say this, I will save this video on Instagram. It, it will go onto my feed. It will be on my story, but I will save it, upload it to my feed as well. And I will save it on uh, Facebook. So please, please, Genevieve is here. Ask her some questions. She can respond to them directly as I'm reading um, or, or save them for later. Uh, but maybe you'd like to know how she conducts her research um, or what fascinates her about writing historical fiction um, or how it feels to be a bestseller for seven weeks in a row. I'd like to know that. What does that feel like? That must be absolutely brilliant. Um, so let me show you the cover again of The Forgotten Home Child. Here we go. And while I'm doing that, should Facebook, as it does sometimes, drop the connection, don't worry, if I freeze, I will come back and I will restart the recording. So go make yourself a cup of coffee and come back in a few minutes. All right, so let me read you the, uh, the back cover copy of The Forgotten Home Child. The home for unwanted girls meets Orphan Train in this unforgettable novel about a young girl caught in a scheme to rid England's streets of destitute children and the lengths she will go to find her home, her way home, sorry, based on the true story of the British home children. 2018. At 97 years old, Winifred Ellis knows she doesn't have much time left and it's almost a relief to realise that once she's gone, the truth about her shameful past will die with her. But when her great-grandson, Jamie, the spitting image of her dear late husband, asks about his family tree, Winifred can lie, can't lie any longer, even if it means breaking a promise she made so long ago. 1936, 15-year-old Winnie has never known a real home, after running away from an abusive stepfather, she falls in with Mary, Jack and their ragtag group of friends roaming the streets of Liverpool. When the children are caught stealing food, Winnie and Mary are left in Dr Barnardo's Barkingside Home for Girls, a local home for orphans and forgotten children. At Barkingside, Winnie learns she will soon join other boys and girls in a faraway place called Canada. But Winnie's hopes are dashed when she's separated from her friends and sent to live with a family that has brought that has brought her to be an indentured labourer on their farm. Faced with this harsh new reality, Winnie clings to the belief that she will someday find her friends again. Inspired by true events, The Forgotten Home Child is a moving and heartbreaking novel about place, belonging, and finding family beyond the bond of blood. Sounds amazing. I'm not surprised it's been number, uh, number one for seven weeks in a row. Let me show you, um, you've gone all blurry unless I, take my, unless I take my glasses off. It's so disturbing, I can't see you. All right, so I'll show you the cover again. There we go. The Forgotten Home. There we go, The Forgotten Home Child by Genevieve Graham. Chapter One, Winnie, Present Day. My life is spilling onto the street and I am as helpless as a child to stop it. 
Through the living room window I watched my treasured Ulster coat tumble into a mound on the pavement, followed by a flutter of faded grey cotton when my frock lands on top. The old woollen stockings mended so many times, slip out and cushion the books as they fall, then come my boots. My granddaughter, Chrissy is staring down at the little pile with a sort of guilty curiosity, but she sobers when she glances toward the house and sees my stricken expression. She stoops and gathers my things, placing them gently back inside the little wooden trunk I have kept with me for over 80 years. As she snaps the rusted hinge close, I curse the rotted metal for releasing a secret I have kept to myself for so long. Moments later, Chrissy comes into the house and quietly sets the trunk on the floor next to the rest of my things. I'm sorry, Gran, the hinge broke. She puts a warm hand on my shoulder and I pray she will be able to contain the questions flickering in her eyes. But that's the last of it, she says, and I exhale. I have to go pick up Jamie from school. It's my turn in the carpool. Will you be okay for a bit? She'll only be out for a few minutes, and yet I am glad she asked. I've never been comfortable being alone. The silence is too loud, full of so many voices I've loved and lost. I pat the arms of my chair. I'll be fine. I promise to sit right here and not die while you're gone. Chrissy frowns slightly, but grabs her keys and heads to the doorway, where she pauses and glances back at me. I'll be fine. I say again, ashamed of my snide remark. I had only been trying to lighten the mood, but it came out wrong. I'm thrown off by the scene in the street. My gaze drops to the trunk and I wonder if I have enough balance to carry it all the way to my room and put it away before she sees it again. Out of sight, out of mind. I had hoped the trunk would outlive me, that once I was gone, someone could dust it off, open the latches and discover the treasures old Gran had hidden away. Without me to tell the story, no one would be able to figure it out. It would remain forgotten, like the rest of us. I watch Chrissy drive away and my chest tightens with gratitude. My dear granddaughter has become quite protective of me ever since she lost her mother, my daughter Susan, two years ago. Susan and I had shared an apartment, which had suited us both beautifully, until she'd gotten sick. The high point of our week had been playing bridge at the senior centre or shuffling through the mall to see the lights and the people. I should have valued those moments more, but I had always assumed I would be the one going first. It didn't turn out the way I'd hoped, but I am grateful to have had a long and enduring bond with my daughter. Not all of us can be so lucky. It has been difficult living without her, but it is getting easier. These days I see Susan less and less as a woman in pain. My memories of her now are of when she was so small she needed to hold my hand everywhere she went. So small I couldn't resist hugging her on impulse, marvelling that she was mine. And his, of course. Just after Susan's 71st birthday, cancer stole her from me. And it was obvious to everyone that I could no longer look after myself. Every morning and every night, my creaking joints and wasting muscles remind me that the sand in my glass is running low. So when I moved from the apartment to the Shady Pines retirement home, I resigned myself to sitting and waiting for that last grain of sand to fall. Shady Pines was not the worst part of my life, but it was not how I'd imagined it ending. Chrissy and her son, Jamie, saw through my facade and asked me if I wanted to come live with them. I jumped at the chance. The two of them are a small but good family, and I love them with all my heart. They have no idea how important it is for me to be with family. It's all I've ever wanted, really. The front door swings open, bringing a curtain of fresh summer sunshine into the kitchen, along with my tall, dark and handsome great-grandson. When Chrissy's husband left her for another woman ten years ago, Jamie became the man of the house by elimination. Jamie is 16, smart, and the spitting image of his great-grandfather. Hey, Gran, he says, shrugging out of his backpack. Enjoying the new digs? I am. I smile. Thank you. Chrissy bustles in behind him and makes her way to the kitchen. 
She had set a chicken to roast to celebrate my first night in their house. I've lost track of how many first nights I've had in my life, how many times I've had to start over again. Over dinner, Chrissy pries out details about Jamie's day from him, and I listen as he talks about his math teacher, his soccer game, and the fact that one of his friends is getting a car. Jamie is a teenager with teenager things on his mind, but he is a good boy, and he loves his mother. It's easy conversation, and it takes me back so many years. I almost feel like I'm home again. I have homework, Jamie says when he's done, clearing the plates. He edges toward the door, his eyes on the phone. I'll see you tomorrow, Gran. Actually, Chrissy says quickly, I wanted to talk about something with you and Gran. He winces, then glances apologetically at me. Yeah, sure. Let's go to the living room. It's more comfortable there. I'll bring cookies. They help me shuffle to my armchair and Chrissy sets me up with a cup of tea. She's a nurse, following in my footsteps and those of her mother, and she always seems to know what I would like before I ask her for it. There's something reassuring in that. She sits beside Jamie across from me. I just thought maybe we could do this sometimes after supper. Get to know each other a bit. Jamie's expression is pained, and I can't really blame him. I'm sure he'd rather be doing just about anything other than talking to his 97-year-old great-grandmother. Don't look that way, she scolds, and I see regret in her eyes. It's just that now your grandpa is gone. We can't ask her things about when she was growing up, you know? We can't hear any more stories from her. Don't you ever wonder where our family comes from, Jamie? Unease stirs in my chest. I do not want to have this conversation, but I can hear the sadness in Chrissy's voice. She yearns to know more about her family, about my mom. He gives her a weak shrug. I guess, but isn't that what the internet's for? Oh, uh, my life wasn't interesting, I assure them. I can't tell, I can, I can tell you stories about your grandmother, but to be honest, we lived a pretty average life together. Chrissy gestures with her chin toward the trunk, which hasn't been moved since she brought it inside, and I am instantly reminded of all that it holds. I was wondering if you could tell us about that little suitcase, she says. I don't mean to be snoopy, but it looks like it holds more than an average life. I'm sitting perfectly still, and yet I feel myself toppling backwards, as if a lifetime of secrets is unravelling before me. My gnarled fingers curl around the arm of the chair, holding me in place. Gran? Jamie is by my side now, and oh... It is, as, it is as if 80 years have flown away. My hands unclamp. You look so much like your great-grandfather. The thought sticks in my throat. So, so much like him. He grins and again, it's as if I'm looking at my husband, the way he was at Jamie's age, though he had been underfed and toughened by street life. But when he smiled, he lit up my world. Do I? He settles back on the couch. What was he like? I loved Pop, Chrissy tells him. He was quiet and he... She pauses, so I help her out. He had a bit of a temper. Maybe, but I didn't see that very often. I was going to say that he was a good man. He always had time for me and he loved Mum so much. That was obvious. Yes, he did. He was from Ireland, was he? He, was, he wasn't from Ireland, was he? She wonders. I mean, he didn't have the same accent as you. I thought I'd mostly lost mine, I say. I haven't been there in a very long time. Jamie shakes his head. No, you're still real Irish. I wish I had an accent. I wink and reach for my thickest brogue. Come on, boyo. I'm not the one who'd be having an accent. Jamie grins and takes a bite of a cookie as his mother leans toward me. Mum said your family left for London when you were little. Ah! Is that right? And you had four brothers. Why did your parents decide to leave Ireland? How long had it been since I'd thought of my little brothers? I imagine they're all gone now. London was where everyone was going. Jobs, money, a better life. Almost all the English, Irish and Scots living in the countryside moved to the city back then. Was it better? No, 
such a small crowded. What about Pop? Chrissy asks. Where was he from? Oh, he was from London. Did he have any brothers or sisters? He had a sister, I reply. Then I stop, unable to say any more. Only one person in the whole world knows my story, and he has been gone for 15 long years. Not even my beautiful daughter, Susan, knew the humiliating truth about her parents. Chrissy and Jamie are watching me, waiting, and my heart races as if I am standing on the edge of a cliff. I'm ashamed to tell my story, but now I have no choice. My family deserves a history. As much as I don't want to talk about my past, I do not want them to wonder, as I always have, about their roots. I'm haunted by the truth that I have kept from everyone I know, everyone I love, everyone but him, of course. Nowadays, doctors have words to describe the way our minds can construct a wall to keep it strong, blocking painful memories in order to help us survive. But youth no longer maintains my walls, and I feel them giving way, brick by brick, spilling long overdue sunlight onto my truths. I have seen enough days to know we have no say over any of them. Life picks us up and drops us where it will. My friends and I were thrown into a whirlpool, and what we did, and we did what we could. But we were only children, after all. We had no idea how to swim. I take a deep, shuddering breath and stare at the trunk. I never expected anyone to ever open that trunk. That was the first chapter of The Forgotten Home Child by Genevieve Graham. Look at that. Number one on the charts in Canada for seven weeks now. Seven weeks. And I am not surprised. So it's available now. It's out now. You can get your hands on it now. <laughs> Judy just said, oh, what's in it? In the trunk. I know. What is in it? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, we have Hank who says, ah, lovely. Judy says, I've got to read this. With lots and lots of lovely comments. Love your choices every day from Phyllis. Oh, that's so kind. Um, so I, I don't, um, I mean, I, I guess I do sort of choose the books, but um, it's actually thanks to the authors and their publishers that, that I am able to do this because when I started this project, it was a bit of a throwaway comment to a couple of author friends and then it suddenly grew. So it's the authors and their publishers uh, who are always uh, in agreement with me reading for them. And for Genevieve, it was, let me just check, it's Simon Schuster Canada. So a huge thank you and a huge shout out to Simon Schuster Canada for letting me do this. Um, Oh, thank you, Genevieve. She just said you have the most beautiful reading voice. Well, that's very kind. I, I very much appreciate that compliment. Thank you. So you have the most amazing book. So <laughs> let me show you that cover again. The Forgotten Home Child. It's out now. It's available now. And it is a bestseller. So seven weeks, number one. Those people can't all be wrong. So go check it out and get your hands on it. Let me tell you about tomorrow's book. Tomorrow we are back to a thriller. I'm excited about this one. This is Wendy Walker's The Night Before. I'll show you a different cover because it came out in paperback as well, uh, just this week actually. So that's tomorrow's read, The Night Before by Wendy Walker. And it will be, as always, at 11.30 a.m. on Instagram down here and on Facebook up here. So I hope that you'll be able to join me then. And I hope that you have a lovely Thursday. I was going to say it was Friday, but it's not. It's Thursday. Tomorrow's Friday. Woohoo! Uh, we'll have got through another week, another crazy week. So I hope you enjoyed today's first chapter fun. I hope that you will tune in again. And until then, oh, I'm just going to answer this question. We have Carenza who just said, is there a list of the books you're reading that we can see? Yes. So on Facebook, on my author page, Hannah Mary McKinnon, um, there is at the very top, I pinned a link with the first chapter fun graphic and I have uh, a list of all of the books I'm reading from and I've linked all of the videos as well uh, for you to, to go and see. So you can see the list and then clink, clink. <laughs> You can see the list and then click on the link in that pinned Facebook post on my author page. But they are also saved to uh, my Instagram feed. You can uh, scroll through my feed 
or on my Facebook author page in the video section as well. You'll be able to find all of them there. They're all saved. All right, so I hope you have a lovely afternoon or a lovely day, a lovely evening, and I hope you'll join me again. So until then, please, as always, stay safe, stay kind, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching.